John holds advanced qualifications in law and education. He served UNAM in various managerial positions, including directing the Human Rights and Documentation Center from 2010 to 2015. John's social legal research interests orbit around justice, human rights, the rule of law, and governance. Towards this end, he writes and researches on social justice issues related to justice and colonial colonialism, land justice, housing poverty, workers' rights, minority rights, access to justice, public participation, and access to information, amongst others. John currently serves as media, media op ombudsman of Namibia. He was recently appointed as the regional advisor for Southern Africa for the international NGO, Minority Rights Group International. This position allows him to champion minority rights issues in the SADC subregion. Dr. John Nakuta regularly engages in human rights teaching and training initiatives for members of the NGO community, government representatives, and other interest groups. He is also often requested to develop policy briefs, position papers, and legal opinions on specific social justice issues. John also regularly assists civil society groups in preparation, thematic par parallel or, and shadow reports to the various UN treaty bodies and the African Commission on Human and Political Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Nakuta, who will shed light on the topic, Namibia's democracy under siege. Good morning, everyone. I would repeat what all the others said, all protocols observed. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank the organizers of the event, Harold and others, for having given me the opportunity and the privilege to address you on this very important topic. I want to make a disclaimer, two disclaimers. One. Yes, I am the media ombudsman, but I'm not talking in my position as the media ombudsman. Uh, that's the first one. So I'm speaking as a scholar, uh, someone with a very deep interest and passion in justice issues. Um, and that is the first disclaimer. The second one is that I'm not a political scientist. Didn't study political science. I studied law and education. And for this reason, all my work normally take a very specific position. And that in this particular instance, my focus on the topic, democracy under siege, I'm doing it from a social legal perspective. For context, and I'm not discussing this, what we have read in Monday's paper in the Namibian and a similar um, picture and topic also have, was published by both, I think, The Sun as well as The New Era of what has happened last week, Saturday. I'm not going to give the context of it, I mean the, the background to it, because obviously I did not attend, but all of us are worried 
in terms of what has happened there for various reasons. The South African in me is saying, for those ones that doesn't know me, I am the son of a migrant worker who left of Ambuland in, the mid, in his mid-twenties, never to return to Namibia, and settled in South Africa. Married a wonderful Xhosa lady. Gave birth to nine kids, of which I'm one. And we came back by way of history in the mid 80s as a family and our family house is in Khobabes. So coming back to the South African part of me, linking it to this story. What has happened there, the South Africans and they have normalized the word. They are basically saying what has happened here is because the gentleman here as representative of the people in the mix informal settlement are basically saying in no uncertain terms on such hard form. That is the message that I'm taking from there. Another one, great interest, and again, I'm not discussing it. Not because the ambassador is here, but that is not the topic that I want to discuss. It's that when we talk about democracy and what we have read about what the Minister of Foreign Affairs did this week to summon the German ambassador and the EU ambassador to the office is very closely linked to democracy, which need to be carefully guided, or is what would be the right word, protected, foreign interference. I'm not saying what has happened is a prime example, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying what has happened is an example of foreign interference in domestic affairs. But when we talk about democracy, these are some of the things that we must be careful about. Foreign governments interfering in domestic affairs. And that is the context. I was asked, a little bit out of my comfort zone, to talk about the topic whether the Namibian democracy that we so much hail is under siege and is under threat. How I'm going to do it is to list an issue and to rate it based on what I as an Namibian observe. The first one being, and this is very recent, an international report published by Freedom House in the World 2024. It ranks Namibia very high. Out of 100, we scored 77 for political rights. As Harold mentioned, and all the others that spoke also, said that when it comes to the enjoyment of political rights, Namibia scored 31 out of 40. When it comes to the enjoyment of civil liberties, Namibia was scored 46% out of 60. And that gave us that 70, 77 out of 100%. By all standards, very good. And we all agree. Generally, we cannot say. There is this program on national radio that I make a point to listen every night to between seven and eight people's parliament. If you want to, to hear what the people are saying, how freely they express themselves on whatever matter of interest, 
you listen to the NBC national radio, and I'm not promoting them, you listen to that and you get the sense of how free our country is. And for that, we should call a spade a spade and give credit where credit is due. So yes, we enjoy high levels of political freedom and liberties. No doubt about that. A similar report was published also very recently by the World Economics uh, based in London. If I'm not mistaken, even this, this month or last month, I'm not so sure about this. In terms of governance, Namibia was rated the second best in the world. No, not in the world, excuse me, in Africa. Only Mauritius has been ranked in Africa more than or better than Namibia. Um, and the rating in terms of governance was done in looking at issues of corruption levels, the rule of law, press freedom, and political rights. Toivo is going to talk later about and explain, for example, you will see there, we scored 80.2 in terms of fresh press freedom. By any standard, very, very high. And we're very proud of that. As media ombudsman, I can confirm that indeed, these are not fake figures. This is indeed the situation of the level of press freedom. For that reason, we were scored, out of these factors, we were given an overall B in total. So, but they also say, averages doesn't really tell the story, generally. There are some nuances here and there uh, that needs to be addressed. And so what I did for my presentation I'm going to list something, as I said, and I'm going to rate it in my own ratings. I've identified a few things, things which I think are certain threats to our democracy, and that is the legacy of apartheid. Not, it's not apartheid, don't want to confuse, con confine it just to apartheid, the colonial legacy that our country is still burdened with. Specifically, when it comes to how we have dealt as a country with the colonial legacy of the past. We have chosen, in my opinion, a route for me that is rather troubling. Why do I say so? When it comes to the first genos the genocide that was committed in the uh, 20th century, the first one, on Namibian soil, the way we have handled it, the way we have decided to handle it, leave much to be desired. Was it not for the push from the affected communities, this matter probably would never have reached the doors and corridors of parliament. We know, and I don't need to remind you about the very famous uh, resolution adopted by parliament that was proposed by the late uh, paramount chief of the Avaharero people. And it's only because of that that there was movement on the genocide issue. Secondly, excuse me. The second one is the issue of 
land restitution. The colonial project, both under German colonialism, the colonial project was intimately linked to land dispossession. The South Africans basically just came and perpetuated and furthered what the Germans started in terms of land dispossession. In terms of land dispossession. But it's very striking that the Namibian constitution, which we hail as one of the most progressive, is totally silent on the issue of land restitution. I'm challenging you to look at section 25, subsection 7 of the South African Constitution. In the South African Constitution, the section 7 says, the people that have lost their land in 1913, when the then colonial government took land legally from all black people, 1913, through the Land Act, the South African Constitution says those people that can show that they have lost their land, they are entitled to restitution and if not possible, compensation for the land that they have lost. Our Constitution, this, uh, the equivalent provision, Article 16, is totally silent on the issue of the restitution of land. And yet we know the Sun people are saying our land was taken. At Tosha in 1955 by the South Africans were taken and we were dumped on the trucks and just dumped outside Etosha National Park. Today, Etosha is one of the biggest tourist attractions in Namibia. And the Sun people do not benefit at all. The question of land restitution, which is not dealt with. In fact, those people that are demanding restitution, they are saying, they want their ancestral land back. And I don't know whether it is out of ignorance or out of just simple uh, willfulness that the issue of ancestral land is conflated with Bantu stance. It cannot be. It cannot be that you are deliberately um, conflating ancestral land with Bantu stance. There's also the unspoken issue of the Lubango dungeons. We talk about the, the, the legacies of the past, both historical injustice and transitional injustice, transitional justice issues. And I'm not elaborating on this because Bishop Komita Kameta is going to talk about the issue of reconciliation but it is an unspoken something that needs to be done because the violation in human rights law that the people of the dungeons suffered, it continues. And basically, unless these historical injustices and transitional justice issues are addressed, we are at risk. Our democracy is at risk. Because it cannot be that issues as so central to justice is for one or the other reason not attended to. So, and lastly, on this point, it cannot be. It cannot be that it's a question of let bygones be bygones. We have 
a sector of our community that has been deliberately by law and practice enriched and a generation at the same time of the same, same society that has by law and practice deliberately impoverished. So we are sitting with a situation of having a generational wealth on the one side and generational poverty on the other side. If these things are not addressed, I'm saying it is a serious threat to our peace, democracy, and stability. So if I were to rate it, the way we have dealt with this issue, it's a serious red flag. The second issue that I've decided, and many speakers spoke about this, and she even mentioned the same term, and I've got this term from the former Prime Minister, Nas Angula. He said, the issue of poverty, unemployment, inequality is a time bomb. We have seen uh, the census report being tabled about three weeks ago, and it says that the population, uh, the, the, the population, the youth population, stands in around 70%. The most recent uh, labor force survey says that about 40 something percent, if not more, of young people are unemployed. For how long do we think young people and generally uh, people that are unemployed would continue to just accept the situation. They are saying a hungry person is an angry person. It cannot be. The African Commission, and of course that is both literally and figuratively. We all know when you are physically hungry, you are annoyed, you are agitated. Similarly, the first picture talks about this, where people are deprived of their basic needs and wants. They are angry. That is why the, one, the picture that I've mentioned in the beginning. I want to close this with a reminder, this topic, this theme, with a reminder from, excuse me, from the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. It reminds us, say, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled because the satisfaction of economic, social, and cultural rights is a guarantee for the enjoyment of civil and political rights. Bluntly said, the peace and the peace, liberties that we are so highly celebrating and we are proclaiming that we enjoy, they are only guaranteed for as long as the people are enjoying economic, social, and cultural rights. The way the government has addressed the issue of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, in my way, I'm giving them, it's a, not them, I'm saying that issue is a red card because what has been currently done is unimaginative. It is, it's very lame and unimaginative. I don't know whether I say the right, the, the word correctly, um, whatever, but you know what I mean. It leaves much more to be desired. The next issue, and here I must be very careful, but I said I'm going to say it nonetheless. It must be said. Contemporary forms of discrimination. We know that the Constitution prohibits any form of racial, race, race discrimination in Article 10. 
We've got even one of the first laws passed is the Racial, Discrimi Racial Discrimination Prohibition Act. We will be fooled to think that racism ends in 1990. We will be fooled. In fact, it has taken different forms. So much so that even at UN level, they have established what they call a special repertoire on contemporary forms of racism, xenophobia, because racism has taken other forms. What does this to do with us, John? In our case, we talk about systemic, institutional, and structural racism. No, discrimination rather. Systemic, institutional, and structural racism. What do you mean? It has been defined as systemic discrimination can be understood as the legal rules, policies, and practice or predominant attitudes in either the public or private sector which create advantages for some groups and privilege, privileges for others. Paragraph 12 of General Command Number 20 of the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Contextualize this. About five, six, if not seven years ago, a position is advertised. The people appointed, 14 of them, all female, only one man, all of them from the same ethnic group. Remember the definition? Within an institution, legal rules, practices that seems to advantage a certain group and disadvantage others. And I must add another one Similarly, you walk into Namra and you only see people from the same group. I'm from that group. It cannot be right. It's another form of contemporary racism, contemporary forms of discrimination. The point is, discrimination law says you may not do it intentionally, but you may do it unintentionally. How? By using neutral norms. We look at qualifications, we look at experience, and based on the qualifications, these were the people that came out tops, so we don't have an issue. Human rights law says, justice says, a sensitive leader will not allow these kind of things. Two weeks ago, the director of the National Planning Commission said that it cannot be that the beneficiaries allocated buzzeries for as part of the hydrogen scheme, they, they, within that list, there are not sufficient people from the South. The majority, I haven't seen the list. I'm wondering who are the majorities. But the people are saying, this is but just the tip of the iceberg. In 2018, people demanded to be, to be given the resettlement list. And the minister, Utoni Nyoma, said, do you want war? We will not disclose that list. Why war? Does it mean that list look like this? 
I'm just saying, it's a red flag. It's a serious threat. If we do not do something, Tabo Mbeki said last week, at this last week Saturday, in uh, Uganda, is it now Rwanda, excuse me, Kigali. In Africa, we need as leaders to be very, very careful because of the different ethnic groups of which our countries are composed of. This is a threat to the leaders. And I'm not talking politics. The next one, worrying trends. Worrying trends in terms of the shrinking civic spaces. The law is being used, parliament is being used, institutions are being used to attack civic spaces. Think here, the prohibition of the march against unemployment last year. The law was used, the court system was used to stop young people from raising their concerns in the name of public security. Who said no demonstration must be done or committed or perpetrated on the 21st of January? No, on the 21st of March. That is the day. That is the day where you can make your point. Second one, I don't know whether you've read, on the 27th of July, 2022, the taxi drivers wanted to have a demonstration. The police demanded them to pay a fee for the duration of the march. They couldn't do it. Meanwhile, there is no law whatsoever that says a fee must be paid to the police service to provide their escort services. Abuse of power. Suspension of the managing director of the new era, allegedly for having written too critical an editorial titled No Confidence in Secretive Judiciary. I've read, I was asked as the media ombudsman whether that piece is in any way offensive to the code. I can tell you without fear or favor it is not. But the powers that be, whoever they are, seems to have complained to some others. It's a serious threat to the civic spaces. The last one, when they opened parliament, one of the bills to be introduced is the proposed public bill. Difficult for them. It's way too easy. I was assigning my students to go to the National Assembly and look for this piece of legislation or the proposed. It's not yet there. And I'm saying all of us, peace-loving Namibians, Democrats, must watch the space and do the necessary noise. The big paradox, Namibia, they said, Kilda and Visa once said, Namibia is a democracy without Democrats. For them, for them it is in the context of the incongruence between the supply side and the demand side of democracy. There are opportunities, but people seemingly are not using that opportunities. That is the congruence. 
I want to add, I want to add to what they are saying. There's a serious deficit when it comes to consultation, participation, transparency, and access to information and accountability. These things are not nice to have. They are procedural obligations from a human rights point of view, international human rights point of view. And they are also key features of democracy. So once again, I want you to think of the speed within which the green hydrogen is being done. This week, I was asked to address the workshop organized by the Nama Traditional Council on the issue of public participation. Because they are saying this big project for all what it is worth, it is happening on, in the center of ancestral land. Taken from them during German colonialism. Declared a Sperrgebiet. German colonialism. They are saying the very same thing happened. Once they took our land, and now the very same people, now that's the very same people, the very same thing happens, just in a different way, in the name of development, without prior informed, free prior and informed consent. Question of participation. We are also told, we were told, can you give us, as a nation, because you have entered into an agreement with hyphen in our name, the Namibian people. Can you disclose the agreement, the MOU, up until today, unless I'm wrong, we don't know what has been entered into. Question of transparency. The last one, similarly, the joint declaration. It's not the topic to discuss it. The people are saying, don't stuff down our throats something that we were not part of. Something that basically tells us, except the fact that in 1904, international law saw you as subhumans. That's why when we killed you, we did not commit genocide because genocide was not a crime by then. This is literally the meaning of the joint declaration. And you want to, what is it, stuff it down our throats without having properly engaged us. So that's the missing link. In our system about consultation and even the true meaning of consultation, for the government to think that they can sit in the office, take a decision, have a town hall meeting, and come and inform them we have decided on that. That is not consultation. That is information sharing. Consultation happens prior to the decision, not as an afterthought. So I didn't read it. But for me, it's a serious matter. The second last point, if not my last point, is the state of the independence of our state institutions. And I'm stealing it from the South Africans. They've got chapter nine and they are calling it chapter nine institutions. And it is they are further clarifying the institutions that falls with insects uh, in their chapter nine. The mandate of this, the sole mandate, is to support constitutional democracy. In our context, I want you to think about the ECN. 
I want you to think about the ombudsman, the national ombudsman. I want you to think about the ACC. I want you to think about the Auditor General. And this one is not a state institution, but if we want to go the Herald route, because you said it is the first constitution that actually provides for environment, this office must be taken out of the Ministry of Environment and given the same status as a constitutional body. Now it is not. And the, I don't want to say much more on this, but in terms of the independence of these very important bodies with that mandate, the independence, the institutional independence, the ECN, the CEO of the ECN is listed as a public servant. Equivalent in terms of the Public Service Act, he is an executive director. When EDs are called, the chairperson of the ECN is also called. Does that talk about institutional uh, independence? The ombudsman's budget and now, especially the ombudsman's budget and his resources, human resources, are decided by the Ministry of Justice. The budget of the ombudsman, the most important body when it comes to the observance of administrative justice and human rights, that body, the budget is under the Ministry of Justice. Does that talk about financial independence? Surely not. And it reminds me of the saying that do not bite the hand that feeds you. Is it, the next question, is it by design or by default? It's up to you to decide. Because surely the current situation affects the effectiveness and independence of these institutions. So I was asked, and I want to conclude. So John, with what you've just said, is our democracy under siege? And I'm saying there are some worrying happenings, as I've tried to explain. And if not addressed, may have serious consequences, which must be urgently addressed. And then for that is the yellow flag, is the red flag. And then the other one is there are some issues that are having lower levels of worrisomeness. I don't know whether that's such a word. Tony? <laughs> there are some lower levels of worrisomeness. But serious enough to be concerned about. And that I give a yellow flag. So in conclusion, I want to say the words Oh, and I want to remind us all, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This has been said by Martin Jr., what is it? Martin Luther King Jr. And I also want to remind you, given that I'm also speaking to Germans, what one of your descendants said during the Holocaust period, and I'm paraphrasing. First they came for the communists. I didn't speak because I was not a communist. And then they came for who, and I didn't speak because I was not that. 
Jerry, a kanjo through his bill, came for the homosexuals, the gays and the lesbians. Silent Namibian society because I'm not one of them. Came for the Amoshalelos of this world. Silent because I'm not a young person. Lest we forget. And let us remind ourselves in conclusion. An injustice anyway is a threat to justice everywhere. With that, Monica, thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. This was really a very powerful presentation. I'm a bit concerned that you stepped into the realms of the other speakers a bit, but we will see that later. Oh, yeah. Thank you very, very much. It was a very powerful presentation. There are two things I would like to mention. One, one is, I think, an addendum to what you said earlier with the perpetuation of discrimination. One that I really feel in Namibia that we are all part of in a way is that the perpetuation after the end of apartheid of low salaries is a huge factor in the poverty that we live with today. Because even in government circles, the salary of a cleaner was not incremented after independence. It stayed the same salary of a cleaner. And when you look into state organizations and also private enterprise, salaries are simply too low. That obviously means that in a lot of enterprises, big business, state-owned enterprises and government, you have top earners and you have some very, very low level earners. And that to me is the opposite of creating genera generational wealth. It is exactly um, in uh, um, enduring basically generational poverty. And I'm a big supporter of minimum salaries. I really only feel that um, they, there's a threat that those minimum salaries will stay at the same level to, for 20 years. And then everybody can say, well, I'm paying a minimum, minimum salary. So you cannot really attack me for that. I feel that is one thing that government really needs to attend to is the continuation of generational poverty. The second one, you know that I've been at genocide discussions a thousand times and I mostly listen patiently even when I'm personally attacked. I still listen patiently and hear the other side of the story. But there's one um, aspect that I really totally disagree with you and that is when you say that the joint declaration has not involved um, all sections of the community. I've also spoken, apart from the critics of the Joint Declaration, to many people who are part of the technical committees. And those people have been to the communities. They are made up of the various communities and, and language groups. They have had lengthy discussions on whether, for instance, the communities want a cash pay, a payout or whether they want uh, projects, for instance. 
and they have, the communities have spoken to the technical committee numerous occasions and assured the technical committee that they want dignity in life and dignity is given through projects and not cash, cash pay out, um, payouts. They're also not that concerned with that one sentence, genocide from today's perspective, that is always mentioned as a hampering factor in the, in the joint declaration. They want some benefits from it. They want dignity in life. They want help. One critic of the joint declaration once said, projects, projects, I can't eat projects. And then John Kaswana from the Overhimba community said, of course you can eat projects. I know I'm getting too long and I want uh, John to answer. Uh, but I do want to um, uh, his, his view on that because I feel the criticism on the joint declaration is always falling short. Thank you. And I apologize for the lengthy semi-speech. Just, just to say that I totally agree on the first point on low salaries. In fact, my, uh, initially I wanted to have also something about business and human rights. And I decided maybe I take it out because otherwise I would raise too many issues. Um, I totally agree. The low salaries being paid is perpetuating inequalities. And similarly, when the wage commission was appointed uh, the year before last, whatever, I was personally asked to make a submission in my own personal capacity on whether or not we need a minimum wage. I made a submission to the chairperson of that committee. So I totally agree uh, that there is a need. And um, because we are dealing with people that are getting very low salaries and doing precarious work, and they are being exploited. So I totally agree. Um, on participation rights, this is what the people are saying. The legitimate people, and I'm not from the community, but both the Nama and the Obahero people are saying, um, you, we did not, the, the so-called legitimate, I'm using it very loosely, uh, the legitimate leaders, were not participating. And, and that has also been captured in the report last year issued by the five special rapporteurs from the, from the United Nations insisting on the two governments to begin to include the, these people that feel that they have not yet been included. Okay, then the last point on and here yeah, I will certainly disagree also with you on the genocide. The, the use of the term genocide from today's perspective is having serious implications because with that, Germany is evading legal liability. So it can't be let it, in, let it be in there. It honestly cannot be because Germany, by using that phrase, is evading legal liability, and that is serious. Uh, good morning, everybody, Ambassador. <laughs> Yeah, stand up. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first, Benita, I would want to comment on your statement. I'm Charles Azeb, sorry. I'm Ch Charles Azeb. I'm from NAST. I'm a lecturer there. And uh, I'm originally, or I'm from Falkas, not originally. I'm from Falkas. Um, but I'll explain the other part. Let me first go to the salary issue. 
Benita, I, I'm a son of a, I'm the last one anyway. I'm a son of a domestic or former domestic worker. She worked for one of the wealthiest politician slash business person. He's late. She worked for him and uh, she retired as a poor and poor someone. So let's not limit this thing of um, poor salaries to government only. It's a universal thing. It's across the board. Retail sector, for example. Retail sector, be it petroleum, be it um, uh, other types of, uh, you know, it's, it's across the board. I just want to say that. Let's not limit it to uh, uh, government only. Although government has little salaries, uh, for cleaners, for example, but it has other benefits that can enhance their livelihood, such as housing benefits, transport, and so on and so on. I'm not a government employee, and I'm not defending the government. I'm just saying what I know about uh, the, 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 the economic situation of the country. <coughs> yeah, um, representation on the negotiation table. Please allow me to be a bit lengthy, because this cannot be said in two minutes. MC, can I be? be so <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Representation. Um, okay, I'm from Paltras, as I said. I, I, let me give my brief background. I'm from Paltras. My great grandfather is a German um, colonialist. He was a magistrate in Kettmann Swap, 1915. My, my grandfather was born. I have German blood, I have Herero blood. As a result of the conflicts, we fled down in south, south, uh, into South Africa and came back and settled in uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gaviru and knows, uh, uh, knows about it. May his soul rest in peace, anyway. Um, um, knows about our history um, from someone who, is so someone who is from the South. Uh, let me say with regard to representation, when the genocide negotiation started, or when this thing was initiated by a uh, late uh, president, he appointed a special envoy, Dr. Z. Zavirwe, and then subsequently a technical committee was established from the government technocrats. Now the uh, motion from the parliament says, German government with the uh, and Namibian government with the participation of the affected communities or parties. That's what the motion says. Now, the president assigned or delegated the responsibility of the affected communities to the vice president then, late Dr. Nikki Iambo. He invited traditional leaders from Herero community as well as from Nama community. I know specifically who were there who are today outside the process. Now, some of these traditional leaders chose to go to U.S. court. Now, my father, who is also late as a result of COVID, Chief Joel Stefanus, he is one of them who chose to be part of it from Falkas. Um, the colleague sitting here is from the Nama community, the traditional authority from Beersheba, and we have other representatives from, um, from um, Panderu. We have from Ojodon Juba in Gunene. Uh, uh, John Kasano was just quoted by, by someone here. So basically representation, we were five to the table. Uh, there was a formation, oh, there is a formation called um, ONCD, which sent representation to the table. And we are the ones who are representing the communities for past seven, eight years. Okay, ninth year now. So representation is definitely a question that is, uh, uh, I don't know, legitimate. I don't know, it hurts me if someone says legitimate uh, representation. Who am I? I've just explained my situation. I've hero blood, I'm Nama speaking, I'm, I'm German, I have German blood, and I, by default I have uh, 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 a Damarasen for that matter. 
it hurts me if that is said. And this was a, a democratic process where chiefs were requested to submit names for representation. And, uh, and this composition, the table on the, um, on, on, on the genocide negotiation table is geographical and demographically representative. Why do I say that? Geographically, regions are represented, the seven regions where uh, um, predominantly Namas and Eros were living. Demographically, we have a Banderu, we have Piu Herero, we have Himba, we have Nama, we have Mi, San, Damara. We have diversity in the representation. Now, it hurts us whenever people are standing authoritatively, trying to be authoritative about this thing. So I just wanted to speak about that. With regard to the issue of legal, say, Okay, last, lastly, uh, with regard to the litigation or legal issues, the motion does not say, and the handset from, from the parliament does not talk about litigation. It talks about negotiation. And that's the spirit that we did uh, help these negotiations uh, uh, through. We moral, historical, and political uh, um, link that is there with us between Germany and Namibia. And that was the, 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 the platform that we used. So let me pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will allow only one more question, and then we uh, break for coffee. Let me now already say that we have a lengthy lunch period of almost two hours. So there's time for interaction between all of you here, between the speakers and the various participants that should give you sufficient time to discuss the issues also maybe in a private group, but uh, we hope that that will uh, fulfill your needs. We need to carry on with our program. Harald, please go ahead. You're the last. Uh, yes, uh, I just quickly wanted to, to say that the joint declaration is a topic on its own and maybe it warrants uh, um, a separate venue in a separate platform where we can really discuss it in, in length. Um, John, thank you very much for your wise words. We share a lot of common interests and the common values, and we know where we disagree and where we agree. One thing that, uh, that I noticed in your speech, and that was worrisome to me, is the fact that you mentioned that uh, the tender board, for instance, and NAMRA are composed of certain ethnic um, realities only, I know there was a big criticism when Telecom at one, at one stage was dominated by, by the Ovarero people in the management structures. And uh, you refer to us as Germans. Please refer to us as German-speaking Namibians. That is very important to us. So I think, and that's maybe a rhetoric question to everybody here, is it not time to change the narrative? Should we not be talking about Namibians? We are still, we are 34 years into independence, and it seems like we are moving further away from the unitary uh, uh, motto that we adopted in 1990, and that is one Namibia, one nation. And to me, there's no alternative to one Namibia, one nation. And, and I'm really getting worried that the narrative is changing back to ethnicity. Our former president, Geingob, always said, let's refer to Namibian victims, not to Ovairero and Nama victims. We are all Namibians. It's a really authority question maybe before we we pause for, for the coffee break, for the tea break. Should we not be changing the narrative? We are all Namibians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hara. Uh, Monica, before we break, would you like to make a short announcement? Yes, thank you. Uh, we have people watching us on Zoom. And there's a feedback from Mr. Harald Schutt uh, from Amusha Solar Namibia Consultancy Services. And he says, thank you, John. Your speech makes it worth to listen to the entire e event. And that um, also gives us pride that we are um, out there in the world and in the space. So thank you very much. And CJ Janssen from Wolf Space says, excellent. Dr. Nakuta, such an encouragement to speak up for justice to prevail. 
Thank you very much, Monica. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the contributions you've been, we have been privileged to listen to this morning already, and we are just barely at the first coffee and tea break, already shows to all of us and all the Zoom participants worldwide how necessary this symposium was, how far-sighted our late professor Tutemeyer was. On that note, there's coffee and tea for just under 30 minutes outside, please.